So we are at the point now where if you want to follow along, you can go ahead and open up R and open up the script. Okay. Um, this is not a part of your script, um, but it's some code that tips you off to a way that we can kind of treat the data. Okay, so within RRBLUP we have this AMAT function and we were using it yesterday by default to create a kinship matrix. But AMAT also has some characteristics in it where it allows us to impute data. Okay, I prefer to impute my data before I bring it into RRBLUP but one way I could do it would be using the AMAT function of RRBLUP. Okay? And so we're setting, we're saying here the max missing is 0 0.5. I would actually, I wouldn't tolerate that much missing data. I'd throw out those markers. I'd probably throw out markers that had more than 10% missing data, right? Um, but I, this will return a vector of essentially names that you can then use this command to drop from the data set. Okay. All right. So this isn't in the script because I've given you the data sets in a way that are kind of ready to go. Um, but I wanted you to have this in case you need to use it to get your own data in shape. Okay. So we're going to start by reading in a kinship matrix. Okay. And not surprisingly, um, the title tells you how I made that matrix. Okay, and you can see what the diagonal is. It's two. Okay, so it's, it's actually what in the literature is usually referred to as an A matrix. Okay, um, you can see as I, as I read it in as a matrix that R ends up adding this V here. And I don't want that. It will make it impossible for me to run um, this this matrix in the data set. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute V for nothing for my column names. I'm also going to make it positive definitive, definite. Okay? And this is this will only run if I've used the corp corp package. Okay. Um, you actually don't okay, I, I I don't know if I should say that you don't have to do this, but um, if you write if you get an error then maybe one of the troubleshooting things is to come back and do that. Uh, but just showing you the new matrix that's generated. Okay, and I'm not even seeing any differences in values here. Um, using the make positive definite function. Okay. All right. So again, all I'm doing is I'm using this statement to give me the first five rows and the first five columns just to do a visual inspection. And I'm doing it again here. And what you notice is V is gone from the column headings. Okay. Um, okay. Going to go ahead and read in um, my marker matrix and I, I have a column here in that matrix for entry um, so this gives me you know I can stick with the original name or I have an entry number that links to that name well I don't really need that so I'm going to drop entry here and you can see that it's gone here okay and then I'm going to bring in my phenotypic data Okay, and you can see here it, I'm really just bringing in a vector with a bluff for my disease rating. Okay, so the first the first thing that I'm going to show you is something that I think is underutilized with respect to RR bluff. Um, so I'm using the mixed solved function. More importantly is I'm, I'm creating an identity matrix here. Okay, and I'm, I'm saying use that identity matrix as my random effects 
and then put in my kinship matrix here. Okay? So basically what's happening here in this model is I have no markers in this model. I have a kinship matrix. Okay? So I'm estimating a blup based on kinship only. Right? This is an important concept because you could do this with no markers at all. If you track the pedigrees in your breeding program, you can use this approach to improve your phenotypic estimate by incorporating kinship relationships. Right? No markers involved. You can use the ls command to see what's there. Um, so we're going to get an estimate of beta, which would be a vector if you had fixed effects. Um, it's, it's a single number here. This is a log likelihood, so it's a model fitting parameter. Um, and then the estimate of this essentially would become the breeding value for your individuals. Okay. And then in this line of code, what I'm doing is I'm creating a histogram that shows me the breeding value of my individuals corrected for kinship. Okay? And so it looks something like this. Okay? So what this represents is, is in theory, a better estimate of the real value of all of the plots in my population because I've used kinship relationships to help strengthen my estimates of, of the value of every individual or plot. Okay? So what do I want to keep? So Horsefall Barrett's system was originally 1 to 12. Using a blup, I've shrunk it so the average is 0. This is, uh, this is not true. This is resistant. This is susceptible. So it's this side that I want to keep, right? Okay. Okay. So let's carry on. Um, different model. In this model, we're going to say Z is equal to X1. So remember, this is my marker matrix now. Z is my random effects. Okay. So now I'm incorporating random effects markers okay and so I'm going to extract those blups I'm going to multiply those blups by my marker matrix, and that's going to be my genomic estimated breeding value. Okay? It's going to be a vector. Right? I can go ahead and graph it. I can compare the log likelihood or model fit. Right? So marginally better. I mean, the truth is these really aren't different. Smaller is better. So if we want to compare the results with RR blup and the original phenotypic data, that is the genomic estimated breeding values and our original phenotypic data, we can run simple linear regression and ask for the summary. And so as you can see here, there is a significant correlation between the original phenotypic data and the genomic estimated breeding values. The adjusted R squared for this analysis is 0 0.27 and it is statistically significant. If we want to visualize this result, it will look like this. Okay, So the genomic estimated breeding values are on our y-axis. The original phenotypic data as a blup is on the x-axis. You can see that there is a significant correlation between that 
phenotypic data on our genomic estimated breeding values. You can also see that if we were to divide this into quadrants, as I'm doing here, that there's a good overlap in this group of individuals that would be selected for resistance based on that original phenotypic data as well as on the genomic estimated breeding value. There are some individuals here which we would have selected based on phenotypic data but not on the genomic estimated breeding values. And then there are a larger number of individuals here that we might be inclined to select based on the genomic estimated breeding values but not on the original phenotypic data. In theory, our breeding values represent a more robust estimate of the potential of these individuals because it's based not only on the original phenotypic data but also based on pedigree information and the marker data. It'll take empirical validation to demonstrate that that is in fact the case. So in order to complete our module on genomic selection, we need to cover cross-validation and prediction of phenotypes from genotypic data only. And we'll come to that in the next webinar.